So the process of scaling Ethereum has started, and there are lots of concerns about a possible hard fork and the implications it will have on the current Ethereum. But in order to understand the possible scenarios for Ethereum's future, we need to understand the past. And it all begins with the Ethereum Classic saga. In this video, we'll explain Ethereum Classic, how it was formed, how this relates to the Ethereum merge and the developments regarding the Ethereum proof of work fork. So Ethereum was created by Vitalik Buterin in 2015. It's a decentralized platform that runs smart contracts. These contracts are applications that run exactly as programmed without any possibility of fraud or third party interference. Make sure that you keep this in mind because it will become important later on. The whole point of creating Ethereum was to have an alternative to the current centralized financial system. This means that we could copy banks and financial institutions, but without having any centralized points of control. This would allow for more transparency and less opportunity for corruption. And in order to achieve this, Ethereum created a public blockchain that would be tamper-proof. But then something happened that nobody expected. In 2016, there was a major hack on the DAO, which is an organization built on the Ethereum blockchain that raised funds for Ethereum projects. This hack resulted in the loss of 3.6 million Ether, which is equivalent to approximately $50 million, which is kind of a lot of money. Of course, Vitalik Buterin, the creator of Ethereum, could not let this slide because it would undermine the whole purpose of Ethereum. So he proposed a hard fork, which is basically a change to the protocol that would invalidate the stolen funds and return them to their rightful owners. Now, if that sounds like a lot of technical jargon, then consider watching our video on crypto forks and how they work. Anyways, you will agree with me that the hard fork seems like a great thing to do because it will recover the stolen funds and it will also make the Ethereum blockchain more secure. However, there were a lot of people who disagreed with the plan. So why did people disagree with this seemingly noble cause? Well, the reason is that the aim of having a decentralized system like Ethereum is to have no central points of control. So by Vitalik Buterin proposing a hard fork, he was essentially saying that he's going to change the code and invalidate all the transactions that have taken place on the Ethereum blockchain up until that point. This would go against the very principles that Ethereum was built on in the first place. So what happened next? Well, instead of rewriting the entire code, Vitalik proposed that they roll back the blockchain to before the hack took place. This would essentially mean that the 3.6 million Ether that was stolen would be returned to their rightful owners and that the rest of the Ethereum blockchain would remain intact. Now, this decision was not taken lightly because it goes against one of the key principles of cryptocurrencies, which is immutability. Immutability means that once a transaction is recorded on the blockchain, it cannot be changed. So by Vitalik proposing to roll back the blockchain, he was essentially saying that transactions are not immutable after all. Think of it like having a time machine and going back in time to change history. It's a pretty big deal, right? This caused a lot of controversy within the Ethereum community and eventually led to a split, with some people agreeing with Vitalik's plan and others disagreeing. Those who disagreed with Vitalik's plan continued to use the original Ethereum blockchain now called Ethereum Classic, while those who agreed with the plan moved to the new blockchain which is simply called Ethereum. So that's a brief overview of what happened. But now you might be wondering, what does this have to do with whether or not Ethereum would be tampered with again? And if Ethereum does get tampered with, what would be the consequences? Well, to answer the first question, Ethereum has been tampered with and a new Ethereum fork known as ETHW has been created. ETHW was born because a small but vocal group of crypto community believes that the network should stick to the proof of work consensus mechanism. Many of these are miners who wish to hold on to their revenue as Ethereum switched to the proof of stake mechanism on September 15th. In recent months, prominent crypto miner Chandler Guo and others have campaigned for ETHW, claiming Ethereum 2.0 will drive crypto miners out of work. Surprisingly, since the launch, there have been over 1.7 billion transactions. The total number of addresses holding ETHW now stands at over 254 million. Secondly, can Ethereum and ETHW coexist? The answer is yes. ETHW developers have been clear that they don't want to engage in a harsh war with Ethereum and will respect user choice. The Fork's supporters say they are driven by principle, not price. 
In other words, they claim that their goal isn't to compete with Ethereum, but to provide an alternative for those who share their vision of what Ethereum should be. This sounds like a noble cause, and is, in fact, achievable, especially when we look at the relationship between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. And now you're probably thinking, if ETHW does thrive, how would ETHW work? Well, to explain this, let's go back in time to Ethereum Classic. When Ethereum Classic was launched, there was an airdrop, and the coins were duplicated. So if you had any Ethereum on the regular Ethereum chain, you were airdropped some Ethereum Classic, meaning you now had coins on the mainstream Ethereum chain and the Ethereum Classic chain. Similarly, there is a possibility of a large-scale ETHW airdrops once the fork has been fully established. This means that if you have Ethereum in your wallets at the time of the fork, you could be airdropped ETHW. Speaking of ETHW, it's important to note that just like Ethereum Classic, the ETHW community is highly interested in the mining process and has been very vocal about their support for it. This is one of the common threads between Ethereum Classic and ETHW. So far, we've established the main differences between ETHW, ETC and the mainstream Ethereum. But there is a catch. As always, and that is the risk of centralization of mainstream Ethereum. You see, unlike Ethereum Classic and ETHW, the popular Ethereum now uses a proof-of-stake consensus model. This new system requires validators to stake 32 ETH with the platform, granting them ability to write and confirm transactions to the Ethereum ledger. In other words, you would need to stake or lock up thousands of dollars before you're allowed to validate blocks on the Ethereum network. This raises the barrier to entry and only those with such large capital will be allowed to validate blocks. Why is this a problem? Decentralization has always been a key objective of crypto and Web3. The fact that Bitcoin is sufficiently decentralized is the main reason why it has remained outside of the crosshairs of the US regulators. This is because it makes it difficult for the government to control the ecosystem by regulating a single validator. Therefore, a more centralized Ethereum could be easily regulated and manipulated by the government. Speaking of manipulations, the second reason centralization could be bad for Ethereum is that it could make it vulnerable to control by venture capitalists, billionaires, banks and crypto exchanges. This is because the new POS system randomly selects stakers to handle the creation of new blocks. But if a corporation or a government has more than one stake, in other words, stakes 32 ETH multiple times, then this greatly increases their likelihood of getting called to validate transactions. So far, we've discussed what Ethereum Classic is, why it was formed, and the key updates regarding the Ethereum proof-of-work fork and why it's significant. But to get a better idea and understanding of the process that would be used to scale ETH in the long run, check out this video on Ethereum sharding.